Hey, this is Christian Buckley. This is another Collab Talk Tweet Jam post Tweet Jam interview. And I'm here with Treb. Hey, Treb, how's it going? Hey, Christian, how's it going? I'm doing Pretty well today. Hopefully, you're doing well. Yeah, doing well. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you are, what you do? All right. So, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Treb Gott, from, originally from Louisiana, so not spelled the way it's pronounced, like everything else down there. And I am CEO and I'm Power BI MVP sites up here in Bellevue, Washington, where we help companies build data cultures. How's that? That's great. And okay. the, the topic of today's uh, uh, of today's session, so we had good turnout, uh, uh -huh. very interactive. We trended briefly. We were in the top 25 on Twitter there for a while. Wow. It was the era of the power platform. Yeah, the, it's oh. funny. The only reason I knew that we trended is because there were some people that were complaining that this collab talk thing knocked them, kept them out of the top 25. So like <laughs> apparently we were at number 25 or something with, with all the politics stuff going on. That's kind of amazing right now. Uh, yeah, we'll take it. I was getting lots of likes and stuff. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. people are listening. It's all good. It was good. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's an action packed hour. I know we always, as we do uh, every time we run through seven questions. So we'd love to get your thoughts around this. So question number one, mm -hmm. we kick things off and some of these are intentionally broad, you know, so read into it what you may. Some people yeah. ask, you know, what did you mean by that? It's like, what did you think I meant by that? Yeah. So here's this one. So how does the Power Platform fit into Microsoft's future strategies? So they, they've done an excellent job over the last few decades, if you will, of capturing the enterprise market, the formal market where everything is, you know, captured, collated, curated and you know stored away in SQL databases and you know analysis services, data warehouses and whatnot. But the reality is that's only about 27% of the data out there according to Forrester. And so what we're seeing is we have this need to do a better job managing the processes and the data that come along with it for our day to day. And so the power platform is really designed to help more of your power user fulfill their own needs while a lot still allowing IT to take part in the process. And so we see a lot of things like what we're doing with Power BI is we're doing self-serve BI, and that's great. The data model is being managed by IT, but business analysts can write their own reports. They don't have to submit a request and go through this whole process anymore. In fact, uh, I had one person tell me, they're not really looking for another report, they just need an answer. And that's the thing with the Power Platform is getting uh, closer to results. And that's why I think this is a great strategy moving forward. Well, you know, it's interesting. So folks that don't know Treb and his background. So one thing that we share is that we are our entry point into this world uh, was through project and portfolio management technology. Yep. Yep. I found my way over to the SharePoint side of things into collaboration knowledge management. I had done some things in the knowledge mm -hmm. management space, but I was more of a project portfolio management and then went into the SharePoint world where mm -hmm. you've gone more into now the new, the Power Platform area and Power BI specifically. But you know, so much of this is we have all of this data, whether it's project management data or collaboration mm -hmm. knowledge data or you know raw data that's coming from systems operations or whatever that is, mm -hmm. and we need to better surface that that information. There was a shift in how Microsoft was looking at product management within the organization uh, when Satya Nadella took over, really put the push so much of the emphasis to you know, data analytics uh -huh. to, to have data-driven decisions about the products, the features, and what people uh -huh. are actually doing. And so here we have all these systems. We have all these enterprise applications collecting all this information. And yet organizations are really bad at surfacing relevant information and then doing things <laughs> based oh, yeah. on information. Well, and, and this is part of the whole thing. When we talk about culture, and I've, I've heard people, you know, mention data culture and app culture and all this other stuff. They're always talking about the tools. It's like the tools are, I won't say they're irrelevant. They're definitely an important part of it, but they're 20% of the effort. You've right. got to change the mind, the mind um, shift, if you will, that if I'm going to ask a question, I need data to prove it. I need to stop managing by emotion. And one of the ways that, or one of the things that we listen for, actually, when we're in meetings with customers, is if they are really data-driven, they will always ask the question, what does the data say? Because data has a voice, it has a place at the table. 
The same thing with when you were looking at the power apps and whatnot. Do they have a clear use case for these things? Because one of the things that we are getting into now is we have, uh, it's funny you mentioned project management. So much of project management is gathering information and then redistributing it. And there was this great template for meeting capture that the Power Apps team had created a while back, but they really hadn't targeted it to the project management environment. So what we've done is we've actually taken it, we've reconstructed it, because uh, there were some interesting things going on it, it, um, that were causing some issues, but we've redone it in a way to make it a power tool for the project manager so that they have a much easier way of gathering that data, pulling it together, disseminating that data, and now uh, we're hoping to layer uh, SharePoint syntax on top of it so we can start mining that data and starting to get uh, patterns out of this. And as we see Project Cortex progress in its releases, that's going to unlock a whole new set of things that we can analyze and help people communicate around. So again, I think the, the strategy of Power Platform unlocks a lot of scenarios that, that were stuck in the product groups for a long time. Mm -hmm. People can build this stuff very quickly. But where it's going to take us is just simply going to be amazing. And when you add on the AI stuff with this, where I can just plug in an AI as easy as a custom visual, oh, what's right. guys limit? And yeah. some of the other questions, we're going to come back to this point, but it's yeah. also becoming a bridge to those other enterprise applications. It's a... Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of what's happening with the power platform is really kind of bridging that long time gap between the Dynamics 365 folks, uh -huh. those communities, and the more of the collaboration technology people where a lot of the, you know, uh, you know a lot of the, the uh, in the Microsoft ecosystem, at least, uh, uh, of the citizen developer movement has really kind of grown and uh, has lived for a long time. Well, well let's jump. Uh, go well, ahead. We're, we're seeing that, too. Uh, because the thing is, when we were all on-prem, doing transactional integration was actually, I won't say it was easy, but it was doable because you you had control over the versions, the, the interfaces, what versions they were and whatnot. When everybody went to the cloud, so say I'm using SharePoint and I've got Jira Online, I've got Salesforce and I've got all these other things. Doing transactional integration doesn't work because you don't have control over that environment anymore. And so what we're seeing is with the Power Platform, it's becoming the integration layer. From a Power BI perspective, we're seeing BI integration. I just need to pull in the data and create the one view of the world. With Power Apps, it's like, oh, I've got you know uh, an app for my sales my sales team. So now I'm writing stuff to SharePoint. I'm writing stuff to Salesforce. I'm writing stuff to you know some other thing, or I'm submitting a service now ticket or something. That's the power that this is giving us is the ability to integrate these things in a way we couldn't even do before. Right. It's it, it's the two way integration. You're exactly right. Yeah. I mean, that's the world that I that I lived in, where where people say, "Well, I want real time analytics of this." Like, well, we can pull down this data from this other system once an hour or once a day, uh, or 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 maybe more frequently, but then limited data sets around this. And now you can have these live data sources coming in and mm -hmm. having it two way and making changes there and pushing things out as well. So it's not just read only. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. That definitely changes things. Well, question number two was how mm -hmm. much of your focus, your, of your business or you personally have shifted towards the power platform and what has driven that change? Well, so, you know, again, started off in project management was pro you know, we were originally a project company. We did project online implementations. And I first got to work with Power BI way back when it was Project Crescent and there was some other project designation. And it was really designed to solve a need. And that by itself would have been interesting, but not compelling. I think what really forced us or what really drove us to go in that direction was when Satya released their data strategy and said, look, we're only going to focus on three tools. But it's silly we're investing in so many different places. We're going to have Excel for the person. We're going to have SSRS for the folks who need printed reports. And we're going to have Power BI. And they had just opened up the Power BI partner program. So we were actually one of the first group of people in. And we went all in. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, no matter what process you're running, no matter what project you're managing, you need reporting. You need to understand what's going on so you can make a decision. And so we focus on the decision making. And the Power Platform came along with that. So that's it's been a compelling uh, reason to go in, 
And our clients are finding it very compelling as a way to use this to solve their business problems. And you have a lot of people, again, in the community. I, mean, that, I know that from the Power BI standpoint, there's a few people that are were in the SharePoint space that are you know big mm-hmm. on the Power BI side of things. Yeah. And of course, you have then also the you know shutting down of InfoPath and the kind wow. of the rise of Microsoft Flow, which was renamed as Automate, and you create flows in Automate. People still call them Microsoft Flows. The flows, so yeah. yeah. Flow and, then, and Stream, two worst names ever for products. Yeah, it's like, right. eh, I feel like it should be on the adult, uh, <laughs> you know, with the what special diapers. What do you mean the worst name? <laughs> like uh, Microsoft Teams? <laughs> no, Teams isn't bad. At least Teams uh, I can get. I guess. But, but, yeah. but, you know, it shouldn't relate to bodily fl- fluids at all. That's the, yes. That was my thing. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> Who came up? All with right, this? so we just uh, we just <laughs> ah, we segue thirteen there. So that's excellent. Uh, okay, so question three. So, what are some of the common solutions and business accelerators being built with the Power Platform? Mm-hmm. Well, let me speak to the stuff that we've been doing because again, I'm the most familiar with that. If you're going to build some of the stuff from scratch, you're talking weeks, months of effort uh, to get there, and when you study the various you know, processes and whatnot, like project management. We talked to a bunch of PMO directors, and what we found was about 85% of what they wanted to get started with was the same. Okay, well, the Power Platform enabled us to roll out a product that gets this done in two days. So that it plugs in, immediately works with their data, gets them 17 reports that they're going to need right away, and then they can move on to the next phase. The other thing about this is that it also allows them to show their stakeholders that they've gotten value very quickly. Same thing with the Power Apps, like the Meeting Capture Tool. We can plug that in. I've got one person who was like jumping for joy, in fact, got up in a meeting and went on for several minutes about how much they love this tool. And I'm going, wow, you know, we we were thinking, okay, this is gonna help them a lot and whatnot, but they were just loving it. And they were giving us great feedback. We were able to iterate on it. But that's the thing, it's rapid, it's quick, you show value extremely fast, and people can immediately see where it belongs in their day-to-day. And to me, that's a huge, huge win from a Microsoft perspective. Because so many times in the past, we've rolled out these big systems, and people are like, deer in the headlights moment, oh God, you're gonna change everything about what I'm doing. And then they have to figure out how do they do their job within the new SharePoint, the new project, the new dynamics. Uh, dynamics, I'm still lost. I'm, I, I, I can't get my head around dynamics. I'm sorry, still trying to figure that one out. But you know, it's it's just it's a uh, it's definitely more tactical. But again, there is a strategic aspect to it that people are really enjoying. So. Yeah, I think a lot of the answers too. I think across questions two and three, some of the you know just the, the common solutions people were going and repeating. And there's, I, you know, I, I talk to a lot of consultants, a lot of you know SI strategic integrators oh. that are have moved a bunch of their business over to that, and that's what customers are asking for those things. So they're able to kind of build a practice where go and build these vanilla versions of these different solutions, and then go in and fine tune it, customize, and it's. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's funny having been in IT for uh, you know almost thirty years, and you see these cycles that come around, and one of mm-hmm. them is the build versus buy discussion, and we seem to be trending back into the build automation part of it. And there's uh, there's a whole other discussion about what happens, you know, or how do uh, ISVs live mm-hmm. within this this world? We're not going to get into that. But question four: We're an ISV. We're an ISV. We're right, living right. quite well in this world. Right. Right. I mean, it, I really there, think there's going to be other product opportunities that are going to come out of that where oh, yeah. you might go find that uh, that that they that customers need a more comprehensive solution and oh. that's more complex than going and building a power app to to help resolve. Well, it's sometimes you want you need it now. It's like you don't realize you need a solution until you need it. And then I don't have time to build it. And so, uh, for example, we have a report pack over the new list infrastructure over the -the out-of-the-box list. So if I want to do all my reporting over the issues list, we've got a pre-built Power BI template for that. And it takes probably about five minutes to get it in place, you gotta put in the list name, whatnot. Boom, you're done. And then if you wanted to change it, you've got something to build on. And so that's a huge, huge win for people. Uh, And when you look at what people are doing with this, one of the most interesting things I have seen done over all the projects I've seen, was actually not done by us, but was being done by an architect. 
So one of the things that uh, commercial architects have to do when they're uh, looking to redo a building is they have to do an ADA, uh, American, Disability, American Disabilities Act uh, assessment, you right. know, measures, stuff and whatnot. Right. It's this massive government form. So this guy basically started building a power app that he could walk around the place with his phone, capture the photos, do measurements, check, check, you know, all this stuff with a power app. And then at the end, click a button, generates the form. I was like, wow, what a cool wow. idea. You know, yeah. it was taking them hours to do this, and now it's minutes. So I think the creativity that it's unlocking is also uh, very interesting because sometimes your greatest product ideas come from watching your users try to solve their own problems. Yeah. And that can help you figure out a better way to do it. So yeah. I think well, it's up to ISVs to do what they, you know, to do better. I think that's also a good, great segue <laughs> into question number four, which again could be a standalone topic and we've actually covered it in the tweet jams before, but what yeah. is or should be the role of the citizen developer and where does the pl power platform fit? I mean, you've kind of addressed that. It's when you need, when you need solutions immediately, but then mm -hmm. I know it's a slightly different discussion because this even came out in the, the tweet jam, some people talking about, What's the role of how do you define what your engineering team, your IT team is versus uh -huh. citizen developers that have some formal training that know something about the systems and the data and build that versus power users, which might be very technical end users, but they're not building solutions. And I know a semantic point, you can define each of those differently within your own organization, but what do you think that role is? <sighs> It's it's a very it's poorly defined. It is uh, can gr bring great benefit and great danger all at the same time. And I say that because I'm working with somebody right now who they're a project manager, they have a tech background. Uh, some MVPs had worked on creating a documentation tool for Power BI, and he actually took their open source code and took it further. I mean, he's taken it much further than I ever thought. He's come up with some really great ideas. And that's the thing is that this power platform acts as an amplifier. And so if you have somebody who is good, they can accomplish great things very quickly. On the other hand, if you have somebody who isn't well-skilled and well-mentored, they can create what we call chaos at light speed. Uh, mm -hmm. You also have uh, the other issue, which is people it's sort of like YouTube. We don't all want to create videos, uh, which is unlike what my son keeps telling me. He's like, he wants to create videos. No, that's fine. Yeah. I just want to watch them. And I think the majority of people in the org just want to use the tools. So it falls to one or two people to do it. And this is a danger point for many companies. Uh, I know one company in the Midwest, they had the lady, and the lady knew how to do every bit of the reporting, knew all the tools, knew all the data, all the ins and outs, everything, and came in one day and had been offered basically uh, from another company to double her salary. So she left. Now what? So it's been you know, two years and they're still trying to get caught up. And so if I'm investing in the power platform, I need to actually make sure I've got the citizenry involved, not just continually making it one or two persons uh, job to do this. And so but that's, that, that's, that was actually some feedback from today that I saw that, you know, it, it, it there is a bit of a, a learning curve involved. It isn't just something that, Hey, every one of our users that you know, oh. within the system will have a certain amount of knowledge to go and do. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, technology evangelism. There are some that just naturally gravitate towards this citizen oh. developer kind of thing. They want to learn more. They want to go and build these things, solve these problems, oh. but it's not everybody. Right. But to your point, you can't put all of your eggs into the basket of a single person uh -huh. that you need to find and develop, you know, multiple people and have that backup plan. Well, we had one company, we taught 72 people on how to use Power BI. And I, I keep seeing this, it's like you, you wind up with about 20% where it really takes. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who keep going. And we've actually had to roll out uh, ongoing mentoring programs to get that percentage up because people, what happens is they just don't have a need for it right away. Right. But three months from now, how do you get them re-engaged and whatnot? So uh, it's the same thing with Power Apps. Uh, I was dangerous with Power Apps probably about four weeks ago. Right now, I'd have to be back in the books. <laughs> it's not my everyday tool. Yeah. But it's sort of, you know, it's, it's like a, it, the ebbs and flows sometimes can hurt you. And that's where I you got to be careful about. 
I, I took Unix training and 25 years ago I had use for that and, uh, and, yeah. and it, not so much. Um, no, for a long IBM time. IBM world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I heard that a long time ago. So I, I just remember I you know, came across something. What did I find is like going through storage and I found like a certificate that I had earned for that. And my, you're like, oh yeah, I had some knowledge at some point a long mm -hmm. time ago, mid nineties. Uh, okay. So question number five. So what three things do you wish you had known before getting started with the power platform? Well, you touched upon it with the learning curve. It's like, a, you really can do some really epic things with the Power Platform. I mean, using Power Apps to capture it, Power Automate to act upon it, Power BI to visualize it, amazing, mind-blowing stuff you can do with this. But in order to do epic things, it's going to take you longer than you think because the five minutes to wow thing only is, has a lot of assumptions built into it. Like you have clean data, like you're capturing all the data, then you know everything is the nice happy path. There's that, but there's also the integration gaps. I mean, these are three relatively young tools. There are still gaps between how do you use them? Four. Four. Oh. I just to get the logos, you know, the, yeah, the virtual, I, power virtual agents as well. Virtual yeah. agents, yeah. I'm. Yeah. Um, that's part of a different discussion because virtual <laughs> agents to me are just, uh, they're like, they're an enhanced search. And the future we're working toward is that if you have to search, they failed because that's really the outcome of Project Cortex is to surface up the data when you need it, as you need it. I'm just holding to the so, Microsoft branding. I, I, I know, I know. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just sitting there going, you know, if you have to search, something, yeah. something's not right here. But, but looking at these tools, they, they're all young, and they also are young in the entire Microsoft ecosystem. So in particular, I was trying to write a Power App where I'm writing back to a SharePoint list, and all of a sudden I have a people field or I have a multi-value field. And th then it's like, well, how do you do this? Because everything else, you just click patch and life is good. No, no, there's like 30 lines of code you got to put in there. Okay, that's got to get fixed. That's something that it will get fixed uh, over time. Same thing with Power BI. If you're, And I'll just use SharePoint because that's the most obvious one. Multi-value fields, uh, people fields, that kind of thing. When you hit the list initially, you don't see them. And that's because they're buried under a subquery. You have to know to go over there. Oh, and by the way, we don't retrieve any of the data types, so nothing comes back as numeric or whatnot. And these are all, they're growing pains, but it's a learning curve that everybody has to go up. In fact, this is one of the reasons why we went out, we curated a bunch of content specifically around SharePoint on our uh, GetStartedWithPowerBI.com site because I kept answering the same questions over and over again on the forum. How do I get to a list? How do I get to a document library? How do I combine files? Like, let's just do a video and, and walk you through it. But... But again, it's it's growing pains. I think it's going to get better. Uh, and the net of it is the third thing is really we've had to double our estimates when we've gone in to do work because inevitably it's going it's all these little things that build up and they slow you down. So you you get started very quickly, but then you kind of get to the middle and it's like just trudge, trudge, trudge to get through all the little things and then finally get to the end. So those are my three things. It, great things takes a bit of learning and you know the getting through the the ditch if you will in the middle it's going to take you longer than you thought i think that's good advice because again you know based on the promotional marketing that microsoft's doing against a platform is just oh, yeah. you know, stamp your figure your fingers you're an expert Oof, on it yeah. move forward build some stuff and there's a little more effort involved yeah and that's why uh like i've been i, I did a tech review on a book recently it's called the pro microsoft power platform uh written by Mitchell Pearson, Brian Knight, Devin Knight, and Manuel uh, Quintana. I have to say, great book. I really enjoyed, actually it's one of the books I have enjoyed most doing a tech review on. I, I sat down to all the exercises. You really need something like that to get people engaged, to get them excited about it, because it's the excitement that's gonna carry you through that middle part. It's when you're not excited, it's just drudgery, and then it becomes annoying and, and frustrating. And you know, once you've gone through it a few times, you, you, you're like, okay, I know what to expect. but you want to make sure you get through it as fast as possible. And at least now we're getting more books, uh, Guy in a Cube uh, for Power BI, uh, mm -hmm. stuff Daniel Christian's doing, uh, Shane Young, uh, Laura Rogers. I mean, they're all doing wonderful things to help people work through that cycle. And so I really suggest people, you know, start, start following these people. It's amazing yep. what you're going to wind up uh, learning along the way. 
Exactly. And I'll have to pr provide some links to those. I, I mean, I know all the folks that you mentioned and we'll have yeah. to include that in the blog post as well. Uh, so question six was, what does Microsoft need to change, if anything, about their Power Platform strategy? <laughs> so the most common answer <laughs> licensing, yes. um, was licensing, licensing, and licensing. licensing yes. Uh, so, and it's funny because when people talk about the Power Platform, they really do think there's three products. There's Power Apps, Flo Power Automate, and uh, Power Virtual Agents. And then there's Power BI over here. And those licensing things don't talk to each other at all. So I think Power BI, because it was the first, is actually furthest along. The new premium per user is going to solve a huge problem we've had all along, which is I need all the power of premium, but I don't have 500 people to afford regular premium. So this will bring that cost down. For Power Apps, though, I, I think, A, you can't change pricing in the middle of a budget year, okay? If you've ever had to do budgeting, right? Yeah, that's, I, a, that's a no-go. And just to be fair to Microsoft, with the first change that they've made, I know they've adjusted things a couple times, but they've even you know announced, they said, look, we don't know what this is going to be. We have to kind of understand uh, the, the usage patterns and the response from the community and figure this stuff out. So there's just there's kind of a hold on the licensing. And so then they came out with that. And everybody complained uh, you know, about that, but it's, uh, but yeah, it's it continues to be a point of frustration. I think. So here's the thing that I'm seeing is a they're selling them separately when they really shouldn't. They really have a good play here to sell them together, and create a licensing around that. Secondly, uh, they need to work out what's going on with the E5 story, uh, because now we've got SharePoint E5, we've got add-ons to E5. And, you know, then we've got integrations like with Syntax, they're using AI Builder and Power Apps, except now I got to go buy AI Builder stuff, which is then on top of the Power App stuff. And it's like, I need more consolidated stuff that I can budget around. And that's the thing that enterprises don't really like consumption based pricing, you know, at least from a business perspective, because I only get to budget once a year. I don't get to keep going back and say, oh, I need 10,000 more. It doesn't happen. So I think this is a huge problem, uh, but they really, really do need to start presenting this as a holistic front. And right now I'm seeing, you know, it's, it's four separate products and I never see any end to end examples. Yeah, I, I, I think, and this is more of the speculation, but, you know, kind of looking at what they're doing, trying to shore up the branding, they've just refreshed the logos, mm -hmm. they're tightening some of the messaging around that, I, they're going in that direction. We know they're going to get there. Yeah. And so I, I think there is movement there. And there's other improvements just around the community side of it and talking about it as it's not a platform, but, you know, it, talking about it, this skew of, of you know, power platform as an entity, as a, as a thing. I mean, they hire somebody we both know very well. So they hired Heather Newman to, yeah. uh, you know, to who's, it, you know, comes from with a strong community background for those that know, don't know Heather. Um, so she's a, is she like a, I'm trying to remember what her like principal product manager, but oh. the evangelism aspect of power platform. Uh, but Heather has been in the space for a long time, was an MVP in the Office Apps and Services side, um, but helped put on going back to like tech ed and other Microsoft major conferences. So she's been in and out of Microsoft and in, in the community for a long time. Now having her help build out and expand that community, it's all, only going to help with a lot of these these pieces. And and she also, it's a very uh, uh, friendly voice uh, word to this kind of feedback back from the community. Right. Well, well it, yeah. And the other thing too is, you know, they're they need to decide if they're marketing to large enterprise or small, because there should be a power like a twenty five person power pack that has everything. You know, yeah, they they have a huge opportunity to gather up a lot of mid size and small businesses with this, but all of the marketing and pricing seems to be geared for enterprise, and that's going to be a big problem. Well, we could talk about that. Microsoft has had, uh, you know, historically that problem in a lot of different yeah. areas of going yeah. after the unicorns and and not thinking about the long tail of of customers and building up to that point. So, yeah. I agree with you there. Well, question seven, our last question of the of the tweet jam was, uh, for businesses and individuals who want to get started with the Power Platform, where should they begin? So we've talked about some of the community. You've named some of the folks yeah. that are out there. This mm -hmm. book. You know, any other recommendations about where to get started? Um, 
Yeah, they're like, you know, visit the community sites. Those are a gold mine. And, you know, community.powerbi.com, the PBI uh, communities, they actually, they're power platform communities now. They've, they've yep. joined them all up. They're a great place to look up your questions and start learning. There are several podcasts out there that you should check out. Again, I mentioned a few of them. Um, also, Jason and uh, John keep you up to date on what's going on with the Power BI uh, Bifocal podcast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really depends on where you want to go. And that's the thing that I tell people. It's like, have a project in mind. Because the thing is, if you start with a goal, it makes it much easier to find what works. That said, uh, watch some of the places you go get answers because we have, uh, oddly enough, one of the best places uh, that you can get answers right now is we have a Power BI Reddit group. And the people that are on the, which, you know, Reddit's kind of an interesting place to be in. It can but be, the, yes. It can be very people, colorful. Yes. The, yes, it can be. <laughs> but the people that are in that group are actually very highly skilled and they give you great answers. There have been a few Facebook groups that are Power BI uh, related yep. and Power Up related. Not so much. They're just, you know, self-promotion kind of stuff. So you want to be aware well, of... You know, There's uh, a, like the one, the, yeah. the Cloud 365 one that I participated, like they they get rid of people self-promoting and they leave right. it to questions. But it's, uh, the other one I was going to say is like through the Microsoft tech community and there's mm -hmm. uh, there, there are links and things through that. But by finding some of these communities like Reddit, and especially if you have a specific solution in mind and go and say, hey, along this line, this is what we're trying to do. Solve this problem for our HR organization. Solve this to to link you know, sales and marketing together and automate some of these activities. You're going to find people that have built dozens of different things and will be able to give you some advice. Here's what we learned about this. Here's how we integrated with these other uh, you know, industry specific or or role specific enterprise applications, and and so you can you know tap into the community side of that. It's always a good first step. Well, it, and you you mentioned like HR. We actually had a, a thread on Reddit where somebody was building out an HR solution, and one of the people asked them, "What about uh, salary changes and position changes? How are you going to handle that?" And they were like, oh, "Totally, okay. you know, it, yeah. it'll help you get." basically leverage the the community's experience beyond just the tool but also the problem space right. and so we when we're teaching people we always have them do a personal project because i want them to leave class with that knowledge cemented into something that they're actually going to use every day and so i recommend this for anybody if you've got an app idea if you've got you know something you're trying to automate uh some kind of answer you need Let's start with that and then work our way back into which tool, what training, what, you know, it's a lot easier to do it that way, I think, well, than just. It's, it's, it's not like school where you have to be worried about looking over somebody's shoulders, like, what did they go and do? <laughs> no. Like, no, you encourage that. You want to, like, yeah. what did you go and do? What did you learn? What should I avoid here? If you don't find somebody building something that's similar to what you're doing or exactly what you're doing, and just say, post it out to those communities. Here's what I'm trying to do. And, it may just not have been posted and somebody will have attempted to build something. If it is oh, yeah. brand new, then people will be like, you know, Hey, I, they'll follow along and provide feedback as you're going along the way. So I really think, you know, to, to copy off another market, we really should be, we should call it the maker group because that's what we are. We're like those folks who are with the 3d printers and whatnot. It's like, Oh, look, look how cool this is. I have learned so much from watching these YouTube videos where, uh, there was one that's like taking buttons to the next level. And I'm like, hmm, okay, I'm kind of curious. And I don't even remember who made the video, but I learned a lot. And I'm like, I do this every day, you know, but I still learn something new, something cool. And that's the kind of thing. It's like, how do I build that excitement? How do I build on my knowledge base? But having that personal project really, really, really is where you start. And um, I had one guy who did his uh, fantasy football team that he was going to manage it in Power BI. So that's what we did. We built it from there. And he, he paid for your services for around that. Well, he was building stuff for his company as well, but he, like to really. But that you know, was secondary you know, to what's his second. He was he, was, he wanted to make sure his drafts were you know. On, That's on, right. <laughs> I completely uh, well, understand. Yeah. 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 It's important. Well, Tre we really appreciate your time. Thanks for again for participating today in the in the tweet jam, and thanks for uh, talking and as part of this uh, post tweet jam wrap up. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Excellent. See you later.